class. Welcome to week four of our studies in ethics. Uh, again, here's a summary of the course so far. In week one, we talked about some ethical vocabulary, and you need to understand those words to follow the conversation. And we talked about the ethics of Jesus, that we should love God and love other people. In week two, we got into some of the questions about theology and ethics, about what it means for God to lie behind our ethical commitments. And we talked about uh, the moral argument for God's existence and why a good God might allow evil in the world. Uh, then last week we got into a, a sort of a what's a fascinating to me fascinating philosophical issue today, which is that if we presume that human beings evolved and that that happened without the guidance of God, can the human mind be trusted to perceive moral rights and wrongs? And that is a hot debate in philosophy today. And then we asked uh, a natural follow-up question, which is, can you be good without God? If, uh, if there is no God there, can you fundamentally depend on an ethical system? Not whether or not you can create one, because of course we can, but whether or not it is uh, in any way fundamentally dependable. And then uh, I showed you that little video called The Kite, which I hope you watched, a short little five-minute video about uh, why... God's laws are not actually constraining and limiting to us. They're actually freeing. God's laws set us free. And so those are, those are the weeks we've gone through so far. Um, this week, there's some fascinating things we're going to get into. And, and now I want to kind of expand into uh, an overview of the history of ethics and some of the key players in ethical philosophy throughout history. Uh, I'm going to try to make videos about each one of these guys. There's only uh, two indi individual philosophers I think we're going to look at this week. We'll see if I change that before we before I send out the email. But um, the, I'll tell you I'll tell you what, what other videos we're going to look at this week, and then I'm going to get into some more conversation in this video right here. Um, I'm going to have you look at uh, a guy named Immanuel Kant because Kant was an Enlightenment thinker. In the uh, in the uh, the pivotal point in history, where Rene Descartes had shifted the world towards modern philosophy, and Kant is one of the first thinkers to break free from Judeo-Christian morality, which had dominated Europe since the time of Jesus all the way through the Middle Ages, to obviously to the day of Kant. And uh, he still, still lived in a very Christianized Europe. But he began to construct a moral system and say, are there any moral principles that we can depend on through reason alone, without the Bible and without, without fundamental reference to God? Although Kant will uh, claim that there is a God. Uh, and whether or not he was a devout Christian is a, a question for another time. But we're going to look at Kant's shift to trying to found uh, ethics in reason instead of in the Bible or Christianity or theology. Uh, and then we're going to look at a modern philosopher. We're going to skip over a few. We're going to get to a guy named G.E. Moore. And again, this is a short video. Uh, he was a, a modern ethicist who, about 120 years ago, published uh, a book called Principia Ethica, the Principles of Ethics. And uh, he argues that goodness is just sort of objective. It exists in the world as, as a, a moral fact, the way the color yellow exists. You see it and you know it's yellow and there it is. And if you can't see color, you can't see it. And he says, morals exist in the world. They just are. And you can just see them intuitively. You just know it. And so I want you to look at those two because that we, we've been talking about the theology behind ethics all through the course so far. This is a shift to ethics uh, almost without God or ethics regardless of God. And I want to look at those two. And then I'm going to show you a video called The Trolley Car Dilemma, which is a famous modern uh, thought experiment developed by Philippa Foote to make us uh, think about how we make ethical decisions and whether or not our ethical decisions are consistent and what they're founded on. So you can watch The Trolley Car Dilemma. That's a fun one. And I'd love, if you want to send me a note, I'd love to hear your answer to The Trolley Car Dilemma and what you would do uh, in that particular scenario. Okay, so, um, so that's an introduction of what we're going to do this week. 
Right now, I want to walk over kind of the, the history of ethics so you have the view, the historical view from 30,000 feet. And uh, I'll, I'll admit my bias uh, from the get-go. My education is Western. Uh, I, I, I have not grown up in uh, an Asian country studying the history of Asian ethicists, and I'm not qualified to uh, get into the, the development of ethical systems uh, throughout the world the way I can with particularly Western, European, and American uh, uh, historical uh, sources. Uh, I wish my education was different, but I grew up in a different era, and so that is, that's where my uh, history is. But the, the names that I am going to quote to you are being taught in universities all over the world today. So they're still of uh, international significance. Um, if you go back to the ancient Greco-Roman world, there are early writings on the good life and what it means to live a good life. The Greeks believed that human beings were designed, and were designed with a, a goal in mind. And while the Greeks were very religious, the philosophers held to this idea in a non-religious sort of way. Human beings are brought into the world, and there's a, there's a, a goal uh, that we're aiming at. Uh, they called it a telos. Telos means kind of the end game. Telos is the Greek word for the, the final product. Um, imagine an architect building a building. And he draws the blueprints, and he buys the materials, and he hires the workers. Well, the, the final telos is the building, the thing that he's trying to, to build. But there's a design for it that he's got in mind before he gets to the, the end there. The Greeks believe that you and I have inside of us a, a design for what we're supposed to become. It's early DNA theory, basically. Uh, the Greeks would say that the telos of an acorn is an oak tree. Because written inside that acorn is a blueprint for what it is to become. Uh, it really is early DNA theory. And if the acorn is planted well in good ground and watered and re receives sunlight, then it matures and it becomes the oak tree that it's supposed to be. That's its telos. Well, they believe that you and I have a telos as well. And the telos of a human being is to be a happy, fulfilled, functioning member of society. Uh, the... The state of happiness, they uh, termed eudaimonia. That's the Greek word for it, eudaimonia, which is a, a good, happy, healthy state of productive functioning in the world. Now, they didn't think that every human being has the same telos. And so Aristotle, when he writes about this, will say, the, uh, the end game for a soldier is to be a strong, courageous, good fighter. Whereas the end game for a carpenter is to be a you know a hardworking laborer, but the the telos or, uh, of a carpenter is not the same as the telos of a warrior, a soldier, and they don't reach eudaimonia the same way. They reach eudaimonia by pursuing their telos. If you become exactly what you're designed to be, you will reach happiness and fulfillment, eudaimonia, and so this is the the groundwork for the good life that the Greeks imagined. Aristotle uh, wrote the first significant work of ethics, and it's called the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, and that big word is uh, named after his son, because he wrote it for his son so that his son could learn to live a good life. And, uh, and this was uh, Aristotle's contribution to ethics. And Aristotle says that in order to reach eudaimonia, we have to fulfill our telos. And to fulfill our telos, to reach that end game, we have to live a virtuous life. Virtues, he says, are a, a middle ground between two mistakes. Um, he, he says it's a, a, a mean between uh, two uh, alternative m mistaken uh, paths to take. Um, so, for instance, courage is a middle ground between cowardice, which is not enough courage, and rash, crazy behavior, which is too much courage. And if you have too much courage, you're going to get in trouble. But if you have too little courage, you won't be brave when you need to be brave. So courage is the middle ground, the means between two ends. And, and that, uh, that, me that mean, that, that middle ground, is, um, is discovered. Aristotle defines this in a really unhelpful way. Uh, he says it's virtu living virtuously is living the right way at the right time, and doing the right things for the right people with the right degree of moderation, it, it, it really is 
an appeal, appeal to intuition. You, it's as though you can sort of feel when you're living the right way. A modern philosopher compared this to an archer shooting a, an arrow at a target, and it just kind of feels right when they, they know that they've aimed correctly and fired correctly and they're going to get a bullseye. There's just this gut feeling that they've done it all correctly. Now, that analogy doesn't work because the, the end game is the target. You can see the result. Uh, Aristotle would say that living virtuously ultimately has a target of a good, happy, and fulfilled life. And so that's the, that's the groundwork of the Nicomachean Ethics. It's a, it's a big book, so it's, uh, it's more complicated than that. But that's the, the introduction to ethical thought as was birthed by Aristotle. And that gave rise to a school of ethics that we've already talked about, one of the essentially three major schools of ethics called virtue ethics, living the virtuous life in order to achieve happiness. Um, so that, that was Aristotle. Uh, not long after that, Jesus was born, and Jesus walked the earth teaching very specific ethics. He wasn't the first. You had Confucius, you had uh, Siddhartha Gautama, who we know as the Buddha, uh, and there were other ethical thinkers who had stepped forward and said, here's the right way to live life. Uh, Jesus' ethics are in some ways similar to other ethicists, and in some ways completely different. Uh, I had you watch a video in the first week on the ethics of Jesus. But if you look at the way Jesus said we should deal with our enemies, it is unlike anything else. Because Jesus teaches that we should love not only our neighbors, but love our enemies. And he doesn't just say that we should be polite to our enemies. He says that we should forgive them 70 times 7 times. In other words, just a... Just Never stop forgiving. He says, if they slap you on your right cheek, turn to them the left cheek also. If they steal your jacket, give them your shirt. Uh, he, he teaches not to resist and to fight the person who hurt, hurt you, but instead to treat them with utter grace. Not only is this teaching unlike anything else out there in the world, it's the hardest of Jesus' teachings. And honestly, it, it runs the risk of, of making people like the welcome mat. It runs the risk of allowing injustice in the world. Now, ultimately, I think Christians are supposed to stand up for justice in the world. But when you read Jesus' teachings about loving your enemies, they're pretty stark. They're pretty uh, countercultural and counterintuitive. So, so Jesus is born and, and teaches uh, th this kind of ethic. He also teaches that we should live primarily for the kingdom of God and not for the kingdom of this world, that we should pursue the things of God, and we should pursue loving God and loving other people, and not pursue money. And that's one of the ethical issues that he hits most often. Do not spend your life chasing after money. Uh, it, it looks a little bit strange if you listen to the modern Christian church in America, where most of the hot social debates are about sexuality. Jesus talked very little about sexuality, in part because his culture was already conservative, but he was surrounded by a Roman Empire that was not conservative, that was very much pagan, and he did not spend a lot of time talking about sexual issues. He spent a lot of time talking about money. So it's a little ironic when you see modern American Christians who live filthy rich lives and who stockpile money and then who go around arguing about sexuality. It's as if they didn't listen to the teachings of Jesus at all. Jesus' primary teachings are about living for the kingdom of God and not for the things of this world. So Jesus comes along, radically shifts first Judea and then the Roman Empire uh, and then the entire world. Uh, Constantine in uh, three, I think it's 317, would sign uh, an edict. Uh, in which he would declare the end of the persecution of Christians. He did not make it the official religion of the Roman Empire, which is a mistake that uh, people often make. Um, I think it's called the, what is it, the Edict of Milan, uh, in which Constantine declares the end of um, uh, Christian persecution. So then the Christian church is free to spread throughout the uh, Roman Empire. Um, around this time, uh, uh, philosopher lived uh, whose name was Augustine, and he came from uh, Hippo. Uh, he was born in North Africa. He was an African, and um, 
uh, in his younger years, uh, was uh, part of a, well, his mother was a Christian. So his mother, Monica, attempted to raise him uh, as a Christian. But he was a brilliant scholastic mind who uh, would go on to reject his mother's faith and become part of this weird religious sect called Manichaeism, which followed a guy named Manny. And um, uh, would go on to embrace this sort of mystical cult until one day at the, at the very lowest point in his life, he would turn and pick up a Bible and begin to read, and he would discover the love of Jesus and then become a Christian. And he went on to become one of the greatest Christian thinkers of all of history. He became a great, uh, he was already a great academic, so he became a great uh, debater for the Christian faith and uh, a great writer for the Christian faith. And if you, if you want to read a good book, it's not, it's not short, but it's not difficult to read. The Confessions of Augustine are one of the greatest, is one of the greatest books of history. Um, Augustine lived from 354 to 430 AD, so that gives you a sense for where he is. Christianity has become uh, permissible within the Roman state, but it, it has competition. Uh, and this is before Rome ultimately fell sometime after Augustine. Um, Augustine's ethics are, are fundamentally Christian. He just wants to propound the teachings of Jesus. But he does this having read and studied and been immersed in the Greek philosophers. He's more attracted to Plato than Aristotle, but certainly he had uh, read the writings of both of them and even writes some dialogues of his own that, that are uh, mirrors of the dialogues of Plato. So Augustine becomes the great voice through which uh, Christianity is spread to the world. Uh, everybody for the next thousand years, if they read anything, they read Augustine and they read the Bible. Uh, anybody in Europe, that is. Augustine, um, one of Augustine's significant contributions to theology is the way he fleshed out the doctrine of what is called original sin. And the doctrine of original sin, which he takes to be Pauline doctrine. He doesn't think he's creating something new. He, he thinks he's uh, quoting Paul. <clears throat> the doctrine of original sin is the doctrine that human beings are born broken. Sin is not just a list of mistakes that we make that you can choose to make or not. We are born in a state of sinfulness. So, for instance, if you imagine a factory in which cars are made and the cars roll off the line ready to drive, but somehow there's a problem in the computers in the factory and the cars, as they're being made, are made wrong. So when they roll off the line, if you turn the key, the, the car just won't turn on. The cars start dysfunctional. Augustine would say that is the state of human life. We are born broken. We don't work from the very beginning. And so ethically, we are born on a path to hell. We're, we're not headed towards heaven and salvation. It's only because Jesus reached down to save us. He walked the earth, he died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he now calls us to himself. That's the only way that we're saved. But otherwise, we're headed towards the junk pile because we are born broken. So that's, uh, that's Augustine. So uh, now you enter into the Middle Ages. Rome falls. The, the Germanic hordes storm down into Rome, and Christianity is now dispersed through Europe. Uh, when, as we talk about the development of ethical theory, we could go, go back and look at the writers of the Middle Ages who focused on Christian morality, particularly uh, humility and a holy life. We could look at the monasteries and the development of the monasteries throughout history. But uh, in our studies of ethics in this course, we, we now go on to pick up with the, uh, the period of the Enlightenment and the, um, the Enlightenment philosophers uh, who would uh, craft new... Uh, approaches to ethics. Uh, Immanuel Kant is the one that we're going to look at uh, in the other lectures this week. Kant was born in 1724 and died in 1804, so that gives you a, a sense for where he falls in the line of things. And Kant uh, tried to develop an ethical uh, uh, system in which reason tells us what principles uh, we fundamentally must live by. And he would come up with, with one in particular that he calls his categorical imperative. And that is that you should treat every 
person with an independent kind of dignity that you can never use a person as a means to an end. Each person is an end in itself. Each individual human being has value of their own. And all ethical laws should be derived from that fundamental principle. Uh, he says you can say that another way. He says, only do what you would want everyone else to do in the same circumstances. Only do the things that you would universalize, that you would make a law for everybody else. Uh, otherwise, he says, uh, ethics would be unreasonable. So this is uh, the first attempt to create uh, an ethical system based on reason alone. Um, I've skipped over um, one particular voice because it's not really an ethical voice. But uh, a couple centuries before, Machiavelli wrote a book called The Prince. And you could say it's a work of ethics or a work of consequentialism. But Machiavelli uh, fundamentally just said that if anybody stands in your way, you should kill him. And this book was a scandal because he wrote it for the Italian princes, the Medicis, who actually did live that way. I mean, you think about the modern mafia and the, the mafia movies that you see, the mobster movies that you see take place in uh, old New York. It's really kind of Machiavellian. Uh, Game of Thrones is a modern study in Machiavellian ethics uh, where everybody just uh, kills to try to get ahead. Uh, so I've skipped that because he's not really seen as an ethicist. But, but Kant now is saying, well, <clears throat> if, if virtue isn't clear enough and if you're not going to live by Christian principles, here's another ethical system that we can build on, and it's an ethical system built on reason. In the next generation after Kant, a guy named Jeremy Bentham uh, would begin writing about ethics himself. And he would bring up a student named John Stuart Mill, who would also write about ethics. And the ethical system that they created is called utilitarianism. And utilitarianism is a, a part of consequentialism. Consequentialism teaches that the only thing that matters in an ethical decision are the consequences. If you do something, it doesn't matter if your motives are good or bad. It doesn't matter if you're following any laws or breaking any laws. If the consequences are good, it was a good ethical action. And a good consequence is a consequence which maximizes happiness in the world. It's fundamentally a kind of hedonism. The, the only actions that are right to do are the ones that make the most people happy. Uh, and this, this became a, a fundamental, fundamental ethical system that's still very popular today. Uh, there's an ethicist at Princeton University named Peter Singer who has written extensively on utilitarianism and defends it. And um, most utilitarians will say, you can argue for anything that you want, but at the heart of it, you're really a utilitarian anyway, because all of your decisions are going through the filter is what I'm doing the best for the most number of people. Uh, they, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, in his criticism of Kant, would say that's the problem with Kant. At his heart, he's still a utilitarian. The, the only reason you're uh, respecting every person as an end in themselves is because it makes the most people happy. And that is utilitarianism, not deontology, which is what Kant uh, is, is often credited as holding. So utilitarianism became an alternate ethical system based on reason, not the scriptures, but with a fundamental difference. You're not trying to find a law to follow. You're just following the principle that you should maximize happiness. Um, the, the problem with utilitarianism, the criticism that it often receives, is that we could do some pretty terrible things and say that they made more people happy than, uh, than they didn't. So for instance, people often point at slavery and said, well, if you took a small population of people and gave them terrible lives, but it made the lives of far more people happier and better, and according to utilitarianism, that's a permissible ethical behavior. Not only permissible, you should do it. You should have slaves if it produces a greater happiness in the world. Most people are not happy with that, uh, that vision of the world, and so a lot of people struggle with utilitarianism because of that. Utilitarians then try to answer, well, uh, maybe we can have uh, different kinds of utilitarianism, and in, 
instead of a utilitarianism which measures an act and the consequences that it produces, we can have a utilitarian, utilitarianism that's committed to a rule and the consequences that it produces. And if the rule is uh, slavery should be allowed, for instance, that actually, as a rule, undermines society as a whole. It actually does more damage than good. And so maybe rule utilitarianism instead of act utilitarianism is a, is a safe way to view utilitarianism, a way to preserve it. Well, the problem there is when you come to uh, exceptions to the rule, you'll say, well, there are certain circumstances in which we have to break the rule, which means that we're then returning to act utilitarianism which puts us back in the situation where there could be an ethical world where somebody suffers horribly for the betterment of most people. And most people don't think that's an ethical, uh, ethical end. Um, after looking at uh, utilitarianism, uh, G.E. Moore is the next person uh, I'd point us towards. And there's a video on G.E. Moore that we're looking at this week. Because G.E. Moore tried to argue, uh, contrary to... Aristotle, Jesus, Kant, and Mill, uh, he would try to argue that there are fundamental moral goods in existence. And you don't need God at all. You just intuitively perceive goodness. Moore would say he's not an intuitionist. He's not saying that intuition is always right. He's just saying that goodness exists in the world the way the color yellow exists. And you perceive it by intuition. Uh, Principia Ethica is, a, is still a good and easy read today. And he disagrees with uh, the utilitarians before him and Kant before him. So again, he's trying to come up with another ethical system that's free of God, the scriptures, and the church, and that's based on, well, I wouldn't say it's based on reason. It's based on intuition. It's based on the human mind instead of a principle given from above. Well, the problem with uh, uh, Moore's theory is that if, if ethical good is intuitively discernible, we certainly disagree with each other a lot on what's actually good. If, if intuition tells us what good is when we see it, why do we fundamentally fight so much over ethical issues? We end up in all kinds of conflicts because people don't see the world the same way, which tends to then suggest that intuition may not be sufficient to determine what is good. So one of two consequences results. Either intuition tells us what is good, but only in the most vague and general sense, so that it, it doesn't help to solve problems like uh, what do we do with abortion and euthanasia and the death penalty. Uh, instead, it just kind of says gentle, uh, general platitudes like, well, human life should be valued, but we can't really solve the tough gray areas or, or debates that surround it. Um, uh, that, that's, so that's one uh, track we can go down. Uh, or we can say, uh, fundamentally, uh, Moore uh, is just not, just not correct, that intuition is not sufficient to reveal uh, goodness in the world. Um, and, so, and so ultimately, Moore's system fails. Um, you could try to argue, I guess, that certain people's intuition is better than others, but ultimately you're not going to have a, a tool by which to intuit who's got it right, uh, which was the same problem with Aristotle and virtue ethics. So those are some different schools of thought that have developed historically, and that, that would be the, the system that we would go through. That would be the chronology we would go through. You'd look at Aristotle, Jesus, Augustine, and then launch to the modern era. You could look at Machiavelli, but only for a second, and then Kant, Bentham and Mill, and G.E. Moore. There are modern uh, skeptical arguments about ethics that we can look at. Uh, I'm not going to go into those here. I might do another video on that later in the course. But um, there are some people who simply say, ultimately, there are no fundamental ethics in the world. And, uh, and those are ethical skeptics who uh, uh, then leave us in, in a state of dismay. Uh, that's a, a brief overview of the history of ethics. Hope that's helpful for you. Go ahead and look at the other videos in this week's lectures. Uh, God bless you. Let me know if I can help you at all. Send me any questions you have, and I hope to see you again soon.